Thanksgiving. Zach is his son's 
serving the Bible believing Christian group, and uh, it's going to be blessed. I've heard them several times, and they are. The world is suffering. So, spread the words. Flower bed. Flower bed. <laughs> Had some great looking flower beds last year. See, maybe you can make a donation to that. Speaking of flower beds, lost well, subject, but Grace, those seeds are in the back there, like two huge bags of seeds. Right. Anybody want some? Go through there. Try to do it today. Go to work in your garden. Go to work in your garden. There they are. Look at that. Look at that. It's not that nice. Now, if, if nobody takes the Tom brother to talk about just kind of planting them all in the church yard, so we don't have to move the grass Also, next one. Anyone interested? Any of the ladies that would be interested in hosting the ladies' night out for the first Thursday in June? Miranda was the uh, host of Obviously, she's not going to be able to do that. So, see, see me about that if you would. And she thanks you in advance for coming in. As we also on the service ministry dinner for June and July. Uh, if, if you're interested, <coughs> head that up for June and July. See Linda call her, have the number provided. Thank you here uh, for every card, every thought, every prayer, your kindness is greatly appreciated. God bless you all. Alan and Carol. Alan and Carol, you can see this morning. Uh, Alan coming in this Tuesday to Weirton. Some more tests. Now, another thank you here from uh, Tom and Barb, both the other church. Our heartfelt thanks to the doctor, everyone, for their acts of kindness and sympathy. Thank you to Dean for being there for us once again as we have lost some of your hearts. Thank you to all that helped with the wonderful dinner <laughs> after the funeral. Live each day as though it's your last because there are no guarantees that we wake up the next time to go to sleep. We are so thankful that Mom lived a Christian life and is resting in heaven. Thank you, Mom. Lord. And uh, then Miranda sends this thank you via text message. And, uh, for if you wanted to know if uh, she said, if I send a thank you message, would you read that? You have to. This from Miranda. Thanks to everyone. Can't believe the amount of love I have felt in this hour of prayer. I still have a long road ahead. Radiation seed therapy starts Monday. It's more biopsy is taken to the nerve at the bottom of my foot. Pray that it has not been infiltrated by the tumor. If it has been infiltrated by the tumor, it will leave the foot. The tumor was the size of a small grapefruit and did a great deal of damage. So praise the Lord, I'm still here. I'm going to be able to take the Lord's help. Praise God that Joe's passed all his classes through all of this, but we won't want to tomorrow when we go. And there's an address in the on that day. We're trying to put the table to the Cheney Side Hospital. The rest of the day, um, I'll be hearing about if you've got something you want me to take over to Moran in Pittsburgh, be over there hopefully later this afternoon. Uh, I'll also be going down to Bill and Luke's, snapping card or note anything you'd like to take it with me. Uh, evening. Service at 6 o'clock, and uh, Bible study and prayer on Wednesday, and special announcement, we've got a youth program starting on Wednesday night, parents, and maybe, maybe sometimes your little headlines come out and listen to that Bible study, because when you've got kids, you're afraid to distract and all that sort of stuff. By the way, distractions don't bother us when there's kids involved, amen? Mm -hmm. When the adults don't pay attention, when the adults come to each other, the adults are ready to train the kids, and uh, the sign of the dying church is when you hear no little voices. It's not like a dying church. So Wednesday nights, though, uh, the kids are going to be here. Uh, it's great time. Bible, Bible memorization and games and, and stuff like that. And uh, it's kind of like when we were kids and we had youth groups. You know, so kids, we've got something in the, in the working there for you. So hope you make it out. All right. For this statement, go stand. Could we add two more people to our prayer concerns? Absolutely, we can do that. My uncle, Monty Patton, fell and broke four ribs and had a stroke this week. And once he's released from the hospital, he'll be engaged. Where is he now? 
I, I think he had us, but I'm not 100% equipped with Trinity. Okay. 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 And another? you had Larry's father-in-law on, Joe Reinemeyer. Joe what? Joe Reinemeyer, the heart issue, and he's doing well. Okay. But because of Miranda's issue, Erica's mother, Jenny Reinemeyer, went to have her foot checked. It's the same foot. Her MRI came back suspicious. She possibly has sarcoma as well, which is very, very rare. She goes to the James Cancer Center Tuesday. Yes, we're all married people. Yes. And the problem is the chance. We're against the general person. I know. You ready? Praise him. Praise him. Tell him his excellent greatness. Let's stand at the same and hold up our service and praise our God and praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise Him, praise Him, to the Son of God's name. Mercy over His wonderful God we lay. Heaven within my speech, we strengthen our earth in the morning. Like a shepherd, to the life of children. together, that we encourage one another, and that as each of us give forth our effort to your service. We ask that as we have gathered, that we give thanks for the reasoning that we are here, and we give you thanks for the fellowship, we give you thanks for each and every individual that has named the name of Christ for their life. We ask the blessing of our family, fellowship together, and that we honor you in the days of our lives. For these things we pray in his name. Amen. 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 Thank you. 
however you want to say it. It's my prayer that we will have the thought we just talked or sang about. We must tell you. I hope that becomes a real motto in our lives. That we will come close to you. We'll ask your guidance and direction in each and every part of our day. Because Satan has a grip on us. We just sometimes don't really realize it. We kind of think we're out there on our own and we think we can handle things. And, but I've learned in my own life that, you know, there are times when I think I've got my handle, I, that's when I least do. So as we go through the rest of our time, as Dean brings our message to us, let us open up our hearts and take it in and realize how important it is to be with you. The Bible leaves a distinct pattern for us to follow. And I am so glad that I belong to this church, that we do follow his path. My prayer is that we will do this and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Morning. We'll read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive, and which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scripture. And that he was seen by Cephas, and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James and all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. Paul there declares the gospel and backs it up with witnesses. All the apostles, Paul himself, over 500 people at one time saw the risen Lord. Saw him with their own eyes. We have no doubt that Christ rose from the grave. Let me see right there in verse 2, by which you are also saved. Let's think on that a moment. The reason we have forgiveness, the reason we have grace, the reason we have mercy and peace, and all those blessings is because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, and then he rose from the grave. We have all those witnesses that testify to it in his word. So as we come around the table this morning, let's, let's think about that. <coughs> that Christ did die in the cross, that he did surely <coughs> rise up from that grave. And he did it because of love. He willingly went to that cross so that we could be reconciled, so that we could have peace with God. And all of us have sinned, and while we try hard not to, we still end up falling short. We got these words here that we have. That if we hold fast, as he says, 
And we are delivered in that sinful life. Let's take a moment now and just think of those words. Think about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. His death on the cross for our sins. Let's pray. Dear Father, we stand before you this morning. When we hear those wonderful words, Father, we know that they are true. We have no doubts in our heart, Father, that your son Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We have all these witnesses that testify to it. We ask you, Father, this time to forgive us for our shortcomings, forgive us for our trespasses. Through our hearts, Father, let us have clean, clean consciences that we come before your table. And remember that in Jesus Christ, we step on that cross. In his name we pray.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as a Christian family, we thank you so much for the honor and privilege we have of being in your house. We thank you for all the wonderful things that you do for us in our everyday lives. And most of all, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to give us the life that we have to follow your word and your scriptures. As we come this time for service to give back to you, let us give back with a very open heart so we can continue building on your kingdom. Bless those who can give and bless those who just did not so fortunately can't give. For this is in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
But Lord, this time I know He's not coming home to me. She said, Lord, my girl, he's not special. And he meant so much to me. And really, I love to see him. But I know it just can't be. So I thank you for the memories. And the moments with me go. And the Lord could tell me he's more than me. More than a name. Winston Churchill paid a great tribute to the young men of the Royal Air Force who mounted up with wings as eagles and with their sheltering wings guarding the land they loved. He said, quote, never in the history of mankind have so many owed so much to so few. But when we think of the cross of Christ and him who died on it, what we say is this, never in the history of the universe has mankind owed so much. The one. The word for the day is tribute. Tribute comes from the Latin word tributum, meaning to allot or to bestow or to grant or to pay. For instance, like in a, a payment by either a ruler or a nation to another nation, acknowledging their submission to that nation. It sometimes is a tribute or a payment for the price of the protection that is offered them. If you ever wonder, well, what, what shall I bring as a tribute? Look at Micah chapter 6. One such <coughs> illustration from Scripture. Uh, what should we bring when we come to the Lord? What shall we bring as a tribute for our protection? In Micah chapter 6, verse 6, he said, What shall I come to the Lord? With what shall I bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calf? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly? With your God. I told you that story about Woodrow. If he could just get that button unhitched, you know, and he'd be able to stand upright. I really believe if we could just get unhitched from ourselves and get connected with Jesus Christ, we could live in tribute to our God. The tribute is also a tax levied on uh, payment in Romans chapter 13. Uh, we're told about taxes. How many of you all pay taxes and, and enjoy it? I think so. You're like, I may have heard people complain about taxes. You know, they complain. Now, taxes are a necessity because of the way governments are set up these days. Before Israel demanded a king, they didn't have taxation as such. But once they wanted a king like all the other nations, then, then they would have taxes, they would have the military draft, and other things like it. In Romans chapter 13, uh, verse uh, number 6. He says, because of this, you also pay tax. He said, well, because of what? Well, he, he mentions in previous verses, verse 1, that every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. There's no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have do you want to have no fear of authority and do what's good? And you'll have praise for the same for it, referring to the governing authority. It is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it, common governing authority, 
does not bear the sword for nothing. For the authority is the minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Now, if you are the governing authority and you have a sword and you're going to use it to carry out your authority against the evildoer, what's he going to do with the sword? For all those capital punishment opposers out there that are against capital punishment, hello. He's either going to cut off a hand or a foot or he's going to take your life. And the book says here through the Apostle Paul that he doesn't hold that sword for nothing. In fact, even in America, it used to mean something when they would say, stop in the name of the Lord, law, or what? I'll shoot. And they would. So Paul says in verse 5, therefore it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all that is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom customs bear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Tribute. Say that with me. Tribute. Again, tribute. Take anything with you today. Tribute. Something that's given, something that is contributed, from which the word contributed, you have the word tribute. When something is contributed, voluntarily as either being due or deserved. It might be a gift. It might be a service that you render to someone. It might be simply a, an expression of gratitude, like these cards that we have received. Those were a tribute to you as the ones who felt necessary to express their thanks. They wanted to give tribute to you by saying thank you. It's something tangible very often. And sometimes, as I said, it's something that's outwardly spoken so that those who are willing to hear it will understand the worth of the individual to whom we are giving tribute, the value of that person, their virtue or their effectiveness or their, their influence in our life. For instance, last week, you remember Jesus gave tribute. He gave a vocal affirmation, you remember? And he gave tribute to that woman, Mary, who had poured out that costly vial of perfume in Mark 14, 9. And he said this will be spoken of in memory of her as a tribute. Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, take a look at that. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. If you have your Bibles. By the way, some of you have your Bibles on the phone like I did this morning. Shame on you for judging me for taking out my phone this morning. I'm going on to my Bible app. And following along with Brother Tim, because I left my Bible in the pulpit. You know, so neat thing about it is you can leave your Bible at home now, like those teenagers at the revival where I was, they, they had their phones out and on service. And I, I, I've learned not to judge real quickly. And I, I looked over and they were they were following in the scripture. You know, one of the elders that was given the communion meditation when I was over there with that before. I said, Where'd you get that? Where'd you get that Bible? They said, Oh, I just typed it in. So I've got a New Testament Bible on that. Right here. And over there in 2 uh, Corinthians 8, Paul makes a vocal affirmation to the, the church, churches. He said, I want you to know about this in verse 1. I want you to know about the grace of God that's been given in the churches of Macedonia. That in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy, their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their building, beyond their ability, they gave their own accord, begging us with a much urging for the favor of participation and the support of the saints. And this not as we'd expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So we urge Titus that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. What Paul is doing here is he's giving tribute to the church at Macedonia. He's, he's putting it in writing. Our tribute to God, Hebrews chapter 13. Tribute, Hebrews 13, verse 15. Now try this next time when you're tempted, like Job's wife, to curse God and wish your husband to die. You don't want to be like, like her. You don't want to be like Job either, who was beginning to give in to despair. But Job realized that the Lord had given and the Lord had what? The Lord had taken away. And he said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, Hebrews 13, 15, what he was doing was he was offering up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of his lips that were giving thanks to his name. And so tribute, 
We might pay tribute to a person. Uh, we might put it in writing. We might direct it heavenward to God. But ultimately, one day, every knee is going to bow, and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father. Philippians chapter 2 says, when he comes, and we're going to confess to the glory of God that Jesus is Lord. Amen? Jesus is Lord. And then he, Jesus, is going to pronounce one of the greatest tributes that can ever be given when he looks straight at you and says, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Our Lord Jesus Christ will give tribute to those who have stayed in the race, who didn't throw away their confidence, and stayed through to the very end. Now, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, we are told that there are six things that the Lord hates. Now, if you were to make a list today of the things that you hate, and I'm not talking about food, all right? You already know which one's at the top of my list. Nothing bigger. Salad dressing and all that. In Proverbs chapter 6, there are six things the Bible says, for which the Lord hates. This sermon began to take root a few days ago, and I saw a picture on Facebook. I put a one tonight group about this. So stay with me one tonight, just for a moment. I said they had a picture of one of our political figures on Facebook, and they had them standing there with that look, and they had this verse by their picture, seeming to imply that from their viewpoint that this political leader, along with many others, exhibit all seven of these things which the Lord hates. I wish Mary Jane was with us this morning, because uh, the first one there that he hates there, he says, these are, these are things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. The first one there, haughty eye, what's your version say there, instead of haughty, somebody, your version may say, proud look. Second is lying tongue. Third, hands that shed innocent blood, uh, immediately think of uh, abortion, and then other life that is taken, like euthanasia, or just life that is needlessly taken, senselessly. Fourth thing, a heart that devises wicked plan, five feet that runs rapidly to evil, six, a false witness who utters lies, you might say, we already said that, not really. A false witness, now we're talking about a court hearing where you were uttering lies about someone else, all right? Like in a court hearing where you sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And then one who spreads strife among his brother. And what I'd like to do this morning is to bring tribute to those who dare to rise and live above the cultural sludge of this world, whose lives bear witness to the grace of God, who are not haughty who are not liars, who are not murderers, who are not treacherous, who are not mischievous, and who are not perjurers, and who are not connivers. I'd like to bring tribute. And the, the slide, I believe, represents a visual for us this morning that even if we can't recall these exact groups, that we can perhaps recall the visual on the screen and then throughout the week, see what we can do as Christians first, Americans second, to bring tribute to those in our world that are demonized and often scorned. I mean, if you ask me, Vietnam War, those, those soldiers are probably the ones that were the least well received. You know what I mean? By the way, hands up to the veterans again. Hands up to those who serve. I was initially label this group to pay tribute to the American soldier, but instead I would like to refer to it as the courageous soldier because there are other soldiers in other countries who also fight for worthy causes. Not all other countries are bad and evil. Now they, there are other countries that fight for freedom, but a tribute to those who more than themselves their country love, to borrow the phrase from that song we sing, who love liberty more than life, who would rather die for freedom so we can live free, whether they volunteered or whether they were drafted and refused to vote for the Canadian border, as many would do. Tim Cox is one individual. Uh, you never met him, probably never knew him, but he was my brother's best man at his wedding. And as Tim's fiance waited for Tim to return home with one month to go on duty in Vietnam, he was killed in action. His mother, Mary Jane, by the way, 
over the age of 90 now still lives in Canton, Ohio. And then as we visited the memorial several years ago, bought one of those bracelets. I meant to wear it this morning and just realized I forgot to bring it with me. I picked up one of those bracelets because it said Timothy R. Bowden. And I thought, well, it did have one for Timothy Cox, but here's another man that went missing in action when his chopper went down. He was the gunman. His mother, his mother traveled for years to different countries trying to see if he was still alive. And I thought, you know what, it'd be kind of neat to send her an email. Just let her know I've got her bracelet here. You can, you can Google the name Timothy R. Bowden, B-O-D-E-N, I believe it is. And screen comes up and people that have written in, I finally send his mom, dad, an email. His mom passed away back in 2010. I wonder how many times she visited that memorial to remember her son. What's kind of neat for me, just personal experience, and bring tribute to this man I've never met. His name was Timothy. Middle initial was R. After I purchased it, I was curious what his middle name was. His middle name is Roy, which is my brother's name, Roy, who's the best man in his wedding, was Timothy Cox. Perhaps you've also heard of a man by the name of Pat Tillman. Remember the professional football player who decided to give up a career for the NFL football, put it on hold, and go serve his country. And he was killed in action. Men like uh, Urban Paul Streely, who I'm going to refer to a little later, later. I'm wondering if perhaps he is related to some here. A second group that I think worthy of bringing tribute, would you agree, would be those heroic parents who would lay down their lives for their children. Like Stephanie Decker, who in March of 2012 sheltered her kids from a tornado in the process, lost part of both legs, one part above the ankle, the other just below, below the knee. And she said, I'm ready to tackle rehab. I'm ready to get that part of this stepping stone completed. And then she said this, quote, I feel really, really good. Really, and here we are with all legs and all limbs. Most of us all the mind, you know, and sometimes we don't we don't have that good attitude. Let's bring tribute to heroic parents like Christina Simos, who just a couple weeks ago, did you hear about this? Up in Massachusetts, the apartment building was burning. She was on the third floor of the, the apartment building. She had a little eighteen month old son, kissed him on the forehead, said, I love you, and she got out of the building the only way she could. It was out through the window, the third floor. Broke her back in the fall, and her boy just came away with a little bruise, maybe at that. She may never walk again, but she says it was worth it. She says, I didn't think twice. Thank God for parents who don't think twice. Like Frederick Martin, who shielded his eight year old son from a gunman and took the bullets and died. Or like I, this one, I thought, what's SPC mean in regard to military? Can I know? I don't know. Special what? Just specialist? I mean, I've seen a special sergeant get specialist. I want to make sure you get this right. Tribute to this man serving in Afghanistan. I can't pronounce his last name. W E I C H E L. Specialist Dennis Weichel, who is a father of three, upon seeing an Afghan boy in danger getting hit by an armored vehicle, he instinctively instinctively lift the child out of harm's way in which action he was tragically struck and killed by this 16-ton truck. Tribute to heroic parents. So that's a heroic soldier, but our soldiers, many of our soldiers, men and women, include their parents, and they're out there doing heroic things. To me, this father is one of the most heroic, and I don't even know his name or his son's name. We actually saw a documentary a couple years ago on this. His son's name is Patrick John Hughes, who is now 23, who was born without eyes. He gets around in a wheelchair with the aid of his father. And he fulfilled his dreams of becoming a world-renowned musician thanks to his dad. His dad would work the graveyard shift so he could then attend school classes with his son as well as band practice after school. And everywhere on the field, he would wheel his boy in that wheelchair. He went, uh, this, this man's son eventually went to graduate school. And I say that, magna cum laude, graduate magna cum laude. Uh -huh. Listen, when I went to school, there was the lower part of the class and the higher part of the class. I was in the part that made the higher part possible, if you, if you follow all that. <laughs> magna cum laude, he's a boy that was born without eyes. Uh, he can't walk, and 
he, he was talking to his dad. Here's what his dad said. He said, I never had any doubt that Patrick could do it. The only question was, could I do it? Could I do my part? How are we doing on that, folks? Can we do our part? Will we do our part? Tribute to the heroic parents. I'd like also to bring tribute to the repentant sinner. I wasn't sure whether Evan Green would have a memorial service. It turns out, Hannah decided not to, so I'd like to bring tribute to her today, as well as Jackie, the one who was instrumental in bringing her to Christ. Emma Green uh, grew up in the Church of Christ. I don't know how old Emma was uh, when she passed. You, you know, was she late 60s, maybe? She was in her 70s. Okay, All her life she lived and understood that she needed Christ, but she was afraid to give her life to Christ because here's, here's what she said. I never felt I would be able to live up to it. Didn't feel like I could live the Christian life like I was. And her whole life she lived in fear. Her whole life. That's not a very rational thing to have in charge of your life, by the way. But she did all of her life. And a few weeks ago, severely stricken with cancer, unable to walk, literally carried into the building in a wheelchair, literally lowered her over the side here, gave her life to Christ, a repentant sinner, and has gone on to be with Christ. I think of Larry Kelly when I think of, of Emma Green. And I remember him coming up out of the waters after Brother Rick had baptized him. Larry in tears said, just wish I'd done it sooner. Larry's at home uh, with the Lord. I think of Ed Kelly as well, who was amputee, you know, and we're, we're worried about how Ed's going to get in his baptistry, you know. And I said, well, someone needs to go back and help Ed. And I was looking through, and here he was hopping up the steps backwards, <laughs> you know, and to be immersed into Jesus Christ. I think of Gladys, who was out there in the audience that day, I believe it was that same day, and she came as well. And how many remember Stanley Black? Remember Stanley Black came after years and years, he came. And uh, when he, he, he said, would you like to change into, you know, the, the robes or whatever? He goes, not as many left. I think he left his socks on, just went in, jeans, shirt, and all. It's cold as all get out, you know, and uh, immersed him. And last, last thing I remember from that day, was him walking up to Gene Raver leaving a trail of water behind him. You know, soaking wet. And then uh, that young young man a couple of weeks ago, uh, again, thank you for your prayers for that as we were in the Bible and he chose his son. Tyler chose his son and his grandfather. And then I look at you. I look at you, a tribute to that repentant sinner who decided, you know what? I'm going to accept Christ. I'm going to give tribute live my life for him. And the fourth group falls into that category as well as I look at you. And that's the authentic Christian. The courageous soldier, the heroic parent, the repentant sinner, and then the authentic Christian. Meaning you're not counterfeit, you're genuine, you're real deal. I mean, how many, how many times have you heard say, I'm not going to that church because there's too many what? Too many hypocrites at that church. I've heard that all the time. Really? Next time they say, there are too many hypocrites. At that church, they want to say, well, which one's name? <laughs> how many? How many are you talking? Too many hypocrites. Now, how many of you understand if there's one hypocrite, one too many, right? Where should the hypocrite be, though, on the Lord's Day? Right where you are, right? And I'm not going to say there aren't any hypocrites here, right? You know who you are. <laughs> you want to raise your hand? Go ahead. Move all that. I know it's hypocrites. And, and I, I got to think of the fact that too many hypocrites. Sure. Well, that used to be my thing too. Man, it's a lot of hypocrites. And so here's what I want you to do this week. I want you to go home and I want you to start listing all these hypocrites that we're talking about. And so I started listing all these hypocrites from the time I was just a little kid. And the first one I could remember, don't know his name, but he was a deacon in our church. And I was at a movie theater with my sister in law, my nieces and all. We were watching, I forget what it was. 101 Dalmatians or something like that. And there was that deacon sitting up for about five or six rows up. He was with a woman, and that woman was not his wife. He was a short man, and his wife was even shorter than him. And this woman was like, that ain't his wife. You know, they're having a good old time, and they're cuddling, they got their arms all around each other. And then they have to look back, and he saw us. And he kind of went, we wave. We wave. And he wasn't around much after that. Then there was that other fellow, he was also, a lot of these are it's really weird, so watch it, watch it now. Um, the, I'm going to give his name out, but we were getting ready to play church softball. This is hypocrite number two on my list. 
And to me, he was, but really, he probably wasn't. Long story short, we're getting ready to play Greenwood Christian Church, and he says, okay, boys, let's go out and give him one H of a game. He used the H word. He used the H word. And then he said, let's pray. <laughs> I'm about 14 years old, and blood's already beginning to boil. We're holding hands praying. I'm getting hotter and hotter when I'm standing there. He's praying, and he's the one praying. And I'm thinking, he just said, let's go give one inch of a game. And finally, after the prayer, I burst into him, and I said, why can't we just go out there and have a good game? Why do you have to say that? And he apologized right then, right there. See, he worked in a steel mill. I mean, he worked in a steel mill before. I'm working in a steel mill, and I know how they talk there. You know how they talk, don't you? <laughs> now, I'm not saying I never talked that way. It's not a habit of my life, hello. And I've admitted that. It's just not a habit of my life. And uh, so he apologized for that. He also cost me a home run. I'm blaming on him. I'm not saying it was his fault. I'm just saying I'm blaming on him. <laughs> uh, he cost me a home run because I hit that ball that day. Man, he was going farther than I ever seen. I'm whizzing around second base. I'm headed toward third. I look out in the field. Here comes. They're getting ready to throw the ball. You know what I'm saying? And I'm looking up. And guess who's the third base coach? <laughs> he had broken trust with me and he's waving me home. And all I can think is, you dirty rat, you want me to get thrown out home plate? And I slid in perfect by the third. Close, he's mad. He didn't cuss anymore, man. He didn't cuss. <laughs> he had broken trust. Who knows? Maybe, maybe I could score a home run. Listen, don't let the hypocrites keep you from scoring a home run. Because I've never hit a, in, the, in the ballpark home run, if you know what I mean. And if I had to do it over again, I would refuse to allow his hypocrisy to rob me of the joy of hitting home plate. And how many people need to quit the Lord because of hypocrites? Or they never come to the Lord because of hypocrites, and they never reach home plate heaven. Well, so that was uh, number two on the list. And then the third one was a preacher. I don't remember his name. Best you were with me at, at the home church. And he, he was a guest speaker, and he was talking about the New York Yankees. And he said, pardon the French, pardon the French, but you know those and he used the D word in the pulpit. Wasn't as bad as the fellow heard I heard speaking a few weeks ago. Used used the S word, used the G word. Uh, I won't go into that. My personal private body parts. And he said, You gotta be a freak for Jesus. And he was doing all sorts of weird stuff. I haven't talked to him yet. But this preacher used the D word. Now, you can use the D word. Mark 16, 16. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. He used the D word for the thing. Now, again, after service, I said, hey, you caught me by surprise. I don't know if our kids were born yet or not, but I'm thinking, mercy. And I said, well, you said pardon the flesh. I said, you swore. And he apologized. He apologized for that. I appreciate that. But that's only number three of them. This letter was the elder who said, pray for my mom. She's got cancer. And two weeks later, he went off with a, another woman and divorced his wife. That was number four. It didn't happen with this. Hey, then Bessie, there, you can listen here. Remember that church in Kentucky? Went to their church dinner. They were having homecoming or something. I thought it weird during the service, during the song service. I don't know why, but I looked up under the pew. About seven or eight rows up, there was a Bud Light beer can underneath the pew. <laughs> man, oh, man. I said, what's that doing in the church building? And then when we were out there on the grounds, the preacher, the first thing I thought was the preacher, because folks, if you're overweight, please don't take offense by what I'm saying. I'm not trying to make fun of you. But it looked like he had a beer gut. Either that or it was an overfilled chicken coop. I don't know which it's okay, but preachers always do that. But I thought, that's kind of strange. Bud Light beer can. Preacher looks like he drinks beer. I dismissed it. That can't be. And then as we were out there on the church grounds with dinner on the grounds, one of the one of the men from the church came up and said, Hey preacher, you got a light? And he was asking for a butt light. Preacher said, Sure do. Preacher reached in his right pocket, pulled out a cigarette lighter, and lit him up right there. I said, Bessie, time for us to go. And we left. Never we left our meal on the ground anyway. I don't know if we threw it away that day. We were out of there. That's number four. And then there's Bob, what's his name, from that church in Maryland that was a womanizer, and he'd have you come up and give my wife hugs. And he pulled a little close to her and like that, make sure that her breasts were right up against his chest. You quit giving him hugs, and I determined that I'd punch him one if he tried to do that again. He was a womanizer, and uh, to me, that was a hypocrite. And you know what? When I got to focusing on the faithfulness of God, I mean, you got your list started all the way, by the way. You already started, did you? I found that I could only come up with five. Since I was hungry, 
Fair Christian Church had about 350 people. All right. Mississippi had about 30. Now we're at 380 Christians. I think. St. Louis, another 300. We're up about 680, 700. Then over Cambridge, Maryland, about 150, 200. We're up about 900. Slainsville, West Virginia, another 100,000. Here, 100, up to 1,100. Then all the Christian conventions have been and all the people on that. I, I probably have, just like you, running that, about thousands and thousands of Christians, right? I can only come up with five. I would say that the number of hypocrites to those who aren't hypocrites is a smidgen. Right? Just, just a tad bit. Still more than there are they. And I dare say, next time someone comes up to you or me and says, man, I'm not sure if there's all hypocrites there, I dare say you can, with biblical accuracy, say, listen, for every hypocrite you name, I can probably come up with 7,000 and if not about to me to bail. Read about Elijah. He thought he was all alone. And everybody else was there. And God said, I still reserve for me 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to the base. Or you just might want to do this. And I say, too many hypocrites think, of course there are. Jesus had his Judas. Paul had his Demas, right? He had his Murray Goldie. He had, he had his Alexander the Coppersmith did him much harm. Well, of course there are hypocrites. They'll always have that. But I notice you're still breathing the same air they breathe. And I notice you're still driving the same roads that they drive. You're probably, if you're living in the same town, you're probably still drinking the same water they're drinking. And I bet you go to the same Walmart brokers and all these, well, not all these, like parking lots all tore up. The hypocrites can't go there right now. So why not go to the same church where you got those hypocrites? Amen? I mean, which one of us haven't encountered this sometime or another in our life? So, thank God for the courageous soldier of Roy Cairn, the repentant sinner. Thank God for authentic Christians. This tribute is for them. And really, this tribute came about as a result of an email received back in March 17, 2014, that I only discovered this past week. <laughs> so if you send me an email, it's not a good way to get a hold of me, all right? I almost deleted it. I was going through the files, deleting the old emails. It says, hello, I'm searching for information about one of my ancestors from Hopedale by the name of Daniel Hawk. Maybe you heard of him. Daniel Hawk, H A W K, died in 1928. His obituary says he was a deacon in a Christian church, but you still have the old church records that could be researched to find information about him. And then he says, My mother was born in Jewett in 1914, and I'm researching her family history. Any response will be appreciated. <laughs> Sincerely, Tom Flower, Valeria, Ohio. I'm thinking I was great. He's looking for a response, and I didn't even know the email was there. I had to put it in March or May. Dear Tom, Dean Blythe here, Minister of Hopedale Church of Christ, Hopedale Ohio, formed the notice of Hopedale Christian Church. My apologies for a second warm response. I was going through the email file today, the leading all the emails came across your email, which I didn't see till today. I stopped what I was doing, pulled out all the church record books, and uh, I've done some research the last hour or so. It's right here on the pulpit here with me, and here people have been able to find. First picture, and I send the pictures of, of the copies in, in this book here, showed that his admission into the church was August 28, 1898. So according to that Google search, that appeared to be a Sunday. I don't know if he was baptized or if he was seen by transfer. The record does not indicate. <coughs> I would presume that it was by baptism. The second picture from the church records, which is really faded, was when he was elected as a deacon. It was on page 175, December 13th, or December 31st, 1898. Brother Daniel Hawk and Brother William Watson were elected by the The third entry from page 191, Dated December 27th, 1909, was still there, in which they had the annual business meeting of the Christian congregation on the above date. Doctor or not, uh, brother Daniel Hawk chose as chairman. And then the fourth was on the one where there was a letter created for removal. I don't know if they went to another congregation. And what happened on June 17th, 1917, was the date of removal. And I said, I've added one more because it appears that this Daniel Hawk. It looks like he had a child uh, by the name of Nellie. It appears to be Nellie on the same line towards Connie. And it mentions that she was buried in 1913. The reason I put that in there was because he had said in his previous email that his mother was born in 1914. 
So I asked him by any chance, would Nellie perhaps be your grandmother? And I closed that letter and rang them all. No, I haven't heard back from him yet. Okay, what do you expect? Took me two months to get back with him. So I keep looking. I keep looking. So what prompted the message on tribute? Was one on the same page where it mentioned that Nellie was married to somebody in 1913. Looks like it says John's. I'm not sure how they wrote that. I happened to see down farther someone, it said, death, February 17th, 1944, killed in action in Italy. And that was one of our church members who had been baptized on May 25th, which would be next Sunday, May 25th, 1934. And, and the name is Urban Hall, but it has the right of Urban, Urban Street. I don't know. I don't know. This is not the book I'm too worried about in life. This is a church writer book, and you can tell it's worn and old and come to pieces, faded. What's most important is, is the man's book of life, right? I would be remiss if I left today without including the final, which is really the first and foremost to whom we give tribute. His picture is center screen the whole time. It's a picture representing the risen Christ. Yes, the courageous soldier, the heroic parent, the repentant sinner, and the faithful, authentic Christian, we ought to pay tribute to them. But it's all because we owe the eternal debt of gratitude to the glorified risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has been part of our communion time. Gave his life for us. He's the real deal. We'll point people to him. Maybe today you're going to uh, decide to follow him. <clears throat> you believe in Christ. You know you need to turn from sin. You're ready to confess him. You're ready to be baptized so your sins may be forgiven and may receive the Spirit. And you're welcome to do that as we sing here in a moment. If you're not ready for that, you want to talk about that, I want you to feel welcome to give. Give me a call. Let me know today after service. Or just call my cell phone. My cell phone is going to hold You can do that today. But here's why you can come to Jesus. He's nothing like those set of things that are an abomination to God. Jesus is humble, not hard. He's true, not a liar. He came to give life, not to take innocent life. He came to do the Father's will, not to get into trouble. He is without sin. He doesn't run quickly to do evil. He is without guile. In other words, he's not a false witness. He is without confusion. He, he, in other words, he does not spread strife. He is the great uniter of the saints. He is the great uniter of this world. And if we will be one with him, as he is with the Father, then the world can be W-O-N. One to Christ can be one O-N in Christ. So if you stand and sing, let's give tribute worthy. His name, amen. Worthy of praise forever.